Take your Bible and open it to Acts chapter number 8. The book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. This is the things that the apostles were doing in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're in our five core values. Uh, two weeks ago we talked about worship and that everything that we do should be worship. We worship uh, here today, but that's just, this is the pep rally. This is the pep rally. We, we worship God wants us to worship every day. Everything that we do should come from a heart that's overflowing in our relationship with God. So anything that we do uh, in the name of Jesus, anything we do because he's on our heart and our mind is worship unto him. You do not have to take up some holy position to worship. You, don't, you can do it quietly. You can do it loudly. You can do it in the morning. You can do it in the afternoon. You can do it as often as you like to. And the great thing about this is our God of the universe who is on the throne in glory. Whenever time, you, anytime your heart is pointed towards him and you're worshiping him, you have his undivided attention. As if, though there are, what, seven billion people, it's like you're the only one. What a wonderful thing. He just meets you there. Now, when I think about what on earth we're here for, that's a title for a book, what on earth are we here for? When I think about that, I think about three things. I think we're, we were created to glorify God. Amen? That is our purpose. We are to glorify God. We are, as Christians, we are to be about the edification or the building up of the other saints. But we are also, most definitely, about the evangelism of the world. Tell the story of Jesus. Now, last week we, we highlighted fellowship because we want you to know that you're not alone. We're in this together. So we worship individually, we worship collectively, and we worship consistently. We fellowship with God, we fellowship with the other saints, but we also fellowship with non-believers. Now there's a difference between fellowship and relationship. Between fellowship and relationship. True, true fellowship comes from the common bond that you have and that common bond comes through Christ. And that's the relationship. Now you can have friendship with non-believers. We are told we should love non-believers. And we should want God's best for them, which actually is what salvation is all about. But we must not neglect our mission of evangelism. I'm going to make a statement that I've been saying for all my years of ministry. If evangelism is not intentional, it's not going to happen. If you're just waiting around to live your day and just haphazardly going on, there's a few things you're going to do. If you have a job, you're going to go to work. If you're out of gas, you're going to stop at a gas station. If you are hungry, you will find food. There are some things that you're just going to do because it's the normal things of the day. But evangelism is not going to happen. I don't mean to be rude. Please look at me. I want to be extremely positive today. And I am positive of this one fact. Unless you're doing evangelism intentionally, it's not going to happen. It's going to be born from a hard, hot heart for God. You're going to say, this is my desire, this is my intention. I believe, personally, that evangelism is not just a responsibility, it's the privilege of the overflow. So when you ask yourself the, this question, how many people am I talking to about the Lord? Who am I talking to the Lord about? If it's not happening the way that you really feel that it should, if, if you have to wonder when the last time you talked to somebody about Jesus is, you need to check your overflow. Because if evangelism is simply a responsibility, you're going to do it for all the wrong re reasons. But it's the privilege of the overflow. And by that I mean when your heart is hot for God, it's going to flow. You're going to have a desire to share that which is important to you, that which means something to you. Other people come to know Christ through our efforts, through our friendship, through our concern, and through our love. 
Amen? And sharing Christ is the greatest gift ever given. Stand with me as we look at our scripture today in Acts chapter 8. Begin reading in verse number 26. The Bible says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to, the, to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, who had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. By the way, a 200-mile trek because he had a spiritual desire in his heart. And Jerusalem was seen as the city of spiritualism. He leaves a place really south of Egypt in Africa to come to this place. I believe something was on his heart. He is returning and he's sitting in his chariot and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit of the Lord, then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? He said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. This, the place in the scripture which he, was, which he read was this. By the way, this is Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8, which is that part of Isaiah 53 that's talking about of the substitutionary death of Christ, his giving his life as a ransom for our souls. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? That's the question. For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. I love that. Did he, he opened his mouth and he preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Let's pray. Now, Father, this is your word, and you thought it very important to bring this story of Philip and the eunuch to Holy Scripture, and you wanted us to know it, to read it, to study it, but Lord, to see your will, your work, your nature, to see Christianity alive, what a life was like filled with the Holy Spirit what not only Philip's job was, but our job. The power of the gospel unto salvation to everyone who believes. Father, thank you for what happened on Calvary. Thank you for paying the debt that we could not pay. Thank you for the love that made it available to all. Thank you, Lord, that when someone like this eunuch will hear and their heart is open that the same thing that happened to me can happen to them. And they can step out of darkness into light. And Lord, in this room today, you have gathered together many, many, many who are children of light. Father, may the overflow of the work of God in us produce the love of the gospel so that others, too, can know you as Savior and Lord. Father, may this not be a same old, same old message. Holy Spirit, add the anointing to it. 
Father, as I've said so many times, I can speak to ears, but you're the only one who can change hearts and lives. And we ask for that to happen today. Lord, I, I know New Holland now, and I really don't think there's anyone here that just thinks that they've got it. Lord, we're just on the journey because we know the one who made us whole and complete. Lord, our mission is not completed until we see you face to face. Let us be about your business. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Verse 26 said, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Now, I've never had an angel come talk to me other than my wife. You should have laughed more at that. I, get, I need all the help I can get. But I still know my duty. I still know the work of the Holy Spirit in my heart. I read in this word, and it tells me the ways of God. And I read it not just so that I can have more understanding of, of facts and figures, but I want to I know the heart of God because that is the working of the Holy Spirit in me. I want to... I wanna, have my finger on, on his, his pulse. So the things that drive him are, will be the same thing that drives me. Now, you may be asking yourself, why did God just not send the angel to talk to this Ethiopian eunuch? I mean, would it have been a simpler story just to, to send that, that angel to tell him? Angels don't know of salvation, not in a personal way. They, they, they knew Christ before he left heaven and came to Bethlehem and was born of the Virgin Mary. They watched as others in heaven, as Jesus uh, grew up quietly in Nazareth in 30 years, not being in the public domain, but they, they saw him when he began his ministry of three and a half years. They saw him when he hung on the cross. They saw him when he, when he gave of his heart and his life. They saw the pain when Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They heard and knew when he said, Under thy hands I commend my spirit. They knew of the, the death. They knew of the burial. And they saw the resurrection on Resurrection Sunday when life came back to that which was truly dead. And the one who has power over the grave came back not so that he would remain alive again, but so that you and I could too. But they haven't personally experienced it. Who shares the gospel? Those who have personally experienced it. Those who have Christ in their heart. So the angel was just a messenger of God. And he told him, here's the word, arise and go. And that's exactly what Philip did. But don't forget, there was a spiritual awakening, if you look in the first part of chapter 8, that was happening in the place called Samaria. And Philip was part of that. And if you remember Acts 1.8, Acts 1.8 says that, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. That had happened. Judea. Samaria. That's where Philip just left to the uttermost parts of the world. So I'm wondering if Philip's just saying he was there in the great spiritual awakening that was happening in Samaria where people were just coming to know Christ in unbelievable ways and the angel said, hey, you've got to leave this great revival and I want you to go to Gaza. Now for those of you who don't know, that's, that's down on the Mediterranean on the southwest part of what we know of today as Israel and it's desert. The road on the way to Egypt, very difficult place. Now, wouldn't he have been better served staying in Samaria where there was such a, a, a land mass of people and, and the story is being told and people are being saved in an unbelievable way? Isn't that the place that you want the preacher to go? But God's will was that the gospel continue on. And he sent his deacon preacher down to that place because he loved the soul of the man who had traveled 200 miles, who came to Jerusalem, but he could not change and, and convert to Judaism because he was a eunuch. 
He could only uh, see from the outside. And as we see here in Scripture, he is going home, and he's in his chariot, and he's reading Scripture from a heart hot for God, and yet there was a roadblock in the way. So what was he to do? Listen, church, I believe God was in heaven saying, I see that man and I hear your heart. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says, he has put eternity in our hearts. That's why when you're with a friend and you're talking, sooner or later that conversation will turn, about, turn to God. How many times have we had, had, had conversations that turn about religion or turn about God? I remember the first time I led someone to the Lord, I didn't even know I was doing it. It was a spend the night party. I was with my friend. He had moved to, to uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, and, and uh, we, were, we were great friends, and I went and spent a week with him during the summer. And sure enough, on, on, a, on one of those nights, we got talking about God, and I'm sitting in the bottom bunk, and he's in the top bunk, and we're, we're just talking about the things of the Lord, and I'm just doing what I do. I just rattle on, you know, talk, 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 talk. And I was just talking to him about what God had done and what he had done for me and all those things. And he interrupted me. How dare he interrupt me? <laughs> Amen. He said, I did it. I said, you did what? He said, I asked the Lord into my heart. I didn't even know what I was. I didn't even give an invitation. Y'all hear me? I just being Brian talking about the Lord. And he got out of bed, went in the living room and told his parents that he had just gotten saved. By the way, I didn't have to, have to tell him to do that either. And the rest of our week, all he could do was talk about the things of God. Isn't it funny that God places eternity in our hearts? And we may not think when we're with our friends that they may even be wanting to be talking about those things. As a matter of fact, somehow, some way, we bought this bill of goods where the world has told us you can't talk about the things of God. Have y'all heard that? You don't talk about politics and you don't talk about religion. Really, I don't want to talk about religion, but you can't hush me up from talking about Jesus. And there is a difference. Who, tell, who made up that rule? I believe his name was Satan, don't you? And you know, you think you're going to offend somebody by telling them about the Lord. I've never been offended. I know some people are offensive, and I don't think we should ever share the word of God rudely. I think we need to get off of our high horse and get down from the pulpit and get down on their level and just share the word of God the way you would want someone to share the word of God with you. I share it this way. I, I want to talk to other people the way I would want someone to talk to my dear loving mom. Kindly. Some people, it's like they're trying to win a war, trying to, to, to get them to join the kingdom. We just need to understand that every soul matters. So Philip went, and he got there, and he was reading Isaiah. Isn't it funny that God had everything beautifully put together, the right person at the right time and the right witness, and they all come together? Only God can do that. Of all the places in the Scriptures to read, he's reading Isaiah 53 that beautifully talks about what Christ would do. And when we talk about sharing Christ with others, most of the time, believers, or they say it this way, I just don't know how to start the conversation. Y'all shake your head if you agree with me. Well, nobody agrees with me. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people in here. I believe if someone came up to you and just said, would you please talk to me about Jesus, you'd be more than happy to, amen? You could share with them all those things in your heart. But you don't know who those people are. So sooner or later, you've got to start the conversation. And I want you to, to read with me in verse 31 
how he begins this conversation. Or actually, it's the end of verse 30. Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? That almost sounds like an insult, doesn't it? This is Brian's vernacular. Do you have any clue what they're talking about? It almost sounds like, are you so stupid? You know, it almost sounds offensive, doesn't it? But yet he's getting to the heart of the matter. I don't care how you begin a conversation with someone. Do you have any spiritual beliefs? I can't tell you how many times I've asked that. Uh, well, yeah. How many people do you know of, if you ask them that question, they'd say no? If you ask them, do you have any spiritual beliefs? Well, they're going to say yeah. I love the key question that when, when they taught us what is called faith, it was, uh, it was something that happened in uh, First Baptist Church of Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, Bobby Welch was the pastor there, and he came up with this way of sharing your faith. And, and the transition, he says, and I love this question. You, you won't remember it, but I, I'll make sure. If you come tonight, I'm going to share it again. It says, in your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? It's not offensive because you're asking them, in your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? By the way, I don't care how you begin the conversation. Just begin the conversation. In this particular case, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading out loud. Uh, Philip heard it. The Holy Spirit said, go talk to them. He ran, heard him. Do you understand? Look in verse 31. How can I unless someone guides me? For all those people, and, and there is a great teaching that's going out there. It's scaring me to death because it's being taught in a lot of our Southern Baptist seminaries today. You just go live your life and other people will see it and get saved. That is as non-scriptural as anything you'll ever hear. You'll never hear me preach that exact word. And the people who believe that are deceived. You'll never see somebody with a hot heart for God not talk to the people about the things of God. How can I unless somebody guides me? If I was one of those preachers that walked around with a mic, Brother Mark, I'd read that and I'd just do a mic drop right there. How can someone go to, to know God unless there's someone who knows Christ who will lovingly, kindly encourage them, share the truth of God? You can't save them. I've had people come and say, Preacher Brian, that's the guy that saved me. Lord, if I saved them, they're not going to make it. Amen? I can't save anybody but I can testify of the one that I know and love. You know, there's a group of people that are so afraid of how the message is shared, they're not sharing anything. It's a matter of fact, there's so many people that are afraid of, of how the message is shared that, they, that those are the ones who really aren't sharing the message. I never have found a bad way of somebody getting saved. That would have been a great place to say amen. As long as somebody does, he opened up his mouth, and it says that he preached Jesus. Look in verse 35. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the Scripture, preach Jesus to him. Just tell the story of Jesus. Tell what Christ has done for you. The man said, well, what hinders me from being baptized? I don't know if he talked to him about baptism. I don't know if he saw people when he was in Jerusalem being baptized. But really what he is saying is, what's going to keep me from getting saved? So he says, verse 37, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. Preacher, I thought that there had to be repentance in that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. You must know who you are, that you are a sinner. You must, believe, you must know who, who Jesus is and what he did for you. And there's a turning from that. That's what the word repentance means. You need, you need to know that your sin will separate you from God from forever. 
And you've got to ask God to do for you what only he can do. You, ask to, you have to ask him to forgive you. You have to confess to him that you believe that he did, died on the cross for you. Did, did he read him and lead him in a, a scriptural prayer? People have talked to me and said, Pastor, do you believe that? I, I believe that I believe that I need to help him in any way that I can. Now, I'm, y'all listen to me, please. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be done here in a little bit. I'll, I'll actually lead someone in a sinner's prayer. But I tell them every time, there's nothing magical in my prayer. And parroting my words is not going to get you saved. I don't mind helping you, but it's got to come from your heart to God's heart because that's where salvation occurs. And if you're willing to get, if, if, you, if somebody needs help, help them. Don't leave them out there struggling. Don't, don't give it that, well, they'll get it if they're going to get it. No, lovingly help them. Guide them along the way. If you need to share a prayer that they can repeat after you, but make sure you let them know it's got to come from their heart. The God who knows our hearts. You know, one of the things I know that the Word of God is true and real is because it has stood the test of so much terrible preaching. Amen? Well, that would have been a good place to amen too, wouldn't it? I mean, people have got up and murdered this thing, and God still saves souls. Lives are still changed. If you're waiting till you're the perfect witness before you share your love of Christ, you're never going to get there. I mean, you could be an eight-year-old boy like me who don't, well, actually, I was probably older than eight. I was about 10, because I was 10 when I got saved. So I was 10 or 11. And you could have been the guy sitting on the bottom bunk just talking. And God could use it to save a soul. If you're waiting to be perfect, you're never going to get there. But he was baptized. He repented. He made it public before everybody. Who all was there? Well, Philip was there. All the people in the caravan were there. They had to know what was get going on. Do not overcomplicate the gospel. But don't dilute it. Today, we're, the church seems to be so pointed Towards we want a great church, we want a great theology, we want a great family, but are we making a great impact? If we're not careful, we're going to become gun collectors instead of soldiers. Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, let's say we've got this antique gun and we love this gun and, and we treasure this gun and we oil it and we polish it and we blew it and we put it up on the showcase and, 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 and we, we just think this is the greatest thing in the world. We just love our gun. Shoot it! It was, it was created to shoot. If your Christianity that means so much to you, you want to work on it and, and polish it and, and you want to showcase it in the and what some call the holy huddle, and you want to talk about how much you love your gun, but you never get out and shoot it, you're more of a gun collector than you are a soldier in the army of God. Shoot something. Amen? Amen. There's been something I heard that's, if you want just enough Christianity, if you're looking for just enough Christianity to get your soul to heaven, if you want just enough so that you got it, I suggest you may not even have that much. If you're just looking for out for you that you get to heaven, I don't know much about hell. I know it's separation from God. I know Jesus said fire, brimstone, where the worm does not perish, weeping, gnashing of teeth. I, I know those things. And I know it's a separation of all the things that are of God, the good, the glory, the joy, the peace, 
the love. It's a separation from that forever. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I do know some things about heaven. And I know when I get to heaven, there's some people that I'm going to meet in heaven. And I'm going to know that I'm there because of them. Barbara Welch was a Sunday school teacher. Who for some reason like that over talkative, prideful, pain in the neck boy. And she poured the love of Christ into me. Kimbrell King was my RA director. For those of you who don't know RA's Royal Ambassadors, it was kind of like Baptist Boy Scouts, to be honest about it. But Kimbrell, for some reason, loved me and told me the things of God and made a huge impact. I remember walking through the house one day and hearing my mom cry out, moaning and groaning. And I went down the hall and peeked into her bedroom and she was on her knees by her bed praying for my soul. Praise God for the prayers of a mom for her stubborn son. I think about Sunday night church at Temple Baptist Church in Dalton, Georgia. In the old building, y'all will love this, an old funeral home where they used to celebrate the dead. Now it was a church, and I found life. And I'm going to walk through glory in the splendor of the grace of God. People are so concerned about what heaven's going to look like. I just know it's going to be perfect, and I'm going to be there. Because of the cross of Calvary because of the blood that was shed, because of Christ making a way, and because someone else cared about a stubborn, insignificant little boy. One thing I am grateful for, I mean, I'm going to get to walk the streets of glory and know that I am there because of the efforts of others who love Christ and the overflow of their love for Christ blessed me. The one thing I'm grateful for is I know I don't have to go walk through hell and see the people that are there because of my ministry too. Because I didn't love God in the overflow enough to share Christ with them. Can I just say, I'm fearful there'll be more people in hell because of my lack of love than there will be of those in heaven because of my love. I don't know how much time God's given me, but I don't have time to play church. I don't. I'm on a mission. Church, I love you. You know that by now. I hope you know that by now. I'd do anything in the world for you. But there's nothing in the love that I have that in any way, shape, form, or fashion can compete with the love that God has for you. We need to be about his business. I can't do anything for yesterday, but I can do something about my today. I tried my best to witness to someone yesterday. As a matter of fact, I went three times trying to witness to that person. Never given the opportunity. But don't you think for a skinny second I'm, I'm through trying. I'm going to pray. I'm going to wait for that divine intervention, that divine time. And I'm going to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So when I tell the story of Jesus, the heart can be ready. How much are you living out of the overflow? I'm going to say it one last time and I'm going to pray. 
if evangelism is not intentional, it's probably never going to happen. Let us be intentional in our love. Let's pray. Father God, I love you. I bless you. I praise you. I thank you. Lord, I don't have the words to describe how grateful I am that you would love someone like me. Lord, if there's anyone in this room today that does not know you as Savior and Lord, Father, I will not take away from the cross of Calvary. I will not add to the cross of Calvary. Father, if that anyone in this room does not know you as Savior and Lord, if they'll just believe that you are the Son of God, that you came to die for their sins, and you, you did, but you rose again so that they can have new life. If they would confess their sins, turn from their sins and not want them to be part of their life, ask you to forgive them, ask you to come into their life and save them, Lord, I know you'll hear their prayer, and they can be born again. They can be saved. They can become a child of God. Father, from their heart to you, I pray that right now, in their words, they will cry out to you, tell you they believe, confess, and ask you to do for them what only you can do. Save them even in this moment, I pray. And Lord, for those that are in this building today that are already Christians, Lord, encourage us, instruct us, Holy Spirit, call us to be about your business. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you're here today and you need to pray that prayer, pray it. If you need help, you come and I'll, I will show you how you can pray it. A moment in time can change eternity. A moment of reaching out to God means you can spend your eternity in his light. That's a good deal. Christian, maybe you're feeling that warming in your heart. God wants us to live in the overflow. Let's be about his business. Let's go to heaven with our mission to take as many people with us as possible.